I'm going to switch it back. Okay, so that's working now, obviously. say how excited I am to have you all on board. Um, as I said before, uh, you are a really great looking group of interns. And I understand the risk that you're taking coming on as interns, but I want you want to let you know that with with uh, good work um, and uh, self-initiative, you can advance very quickly here at the newspaper. So I don't imagine many of you will stay interns for long. Uh, so trust me with that. My name is Robert Prince. I'm the chairman of the board for the Haven Chronicle. And I'm the great, great, great grandson of Albert Havman, who started the Havman Chronicle in 1833. As you're probably aware, we are the oldest family-owned newspaper in the United States. And we are in a time of great struggle right now, as all newspapers are here in the United States. And the main struggle that we're having is do we remain family-owned, even though profits are going down with the newspaper circulations down, or do we uh, go public? And the problem with going public is then we have to answer to our shareholders. And in the history of the United States, newspapers that go public tend, tends to not go terribly well for them. So that's the challenge that we're under right now, and we'll get more into that in a minute. I want to get through this uh, orientation here pretty quickly for you. Today what I want to talk about is the other staff we have here on the Havman Chronicle, a little bit about the history of the Chronicle, the challenges that we're facing in more detail, um, some of the things you'll need to know for staff orientation coming on board with us. Some of the assignments that you're going to be doing as reporters and um, employees of the Havman Chronicle. And then finally, how you can get promoted within the Havman Chronicle, the different layers of promotion. We have a very calculated promotion system here, so it's not like I just promote people who like things that I like and play golf with me. All right, it's very, very systematic, okay? So let's talk a minute about who we are and get my computer to wake back up for me here. Did it? Uh, there we go. Okay. So here's the, the um, web version of the Havman Chronicle. Want to check it out? We have some articles here, um, some interesting stuff. Um, here over in the Chronicle, you can see our staff. And so one of the things that you'll need to do early on here 
is create an entry for yourself so we know who you are and we have some sort of picture for you. And uh, so we, we get a sense, and, and the rest of you can get a sense of who each of you are here in the business. And uh, there's a little bit about me. And then you'll get, be getting some um, communications from our executive assistant, Agatha Crowley, who uh, generally she'll be the one to send you when you've gotten promoted. you get a promotion letter from her. There might be some other administrative stuff. So she's the one who kind of handles all of that for us. So that's, that's basically the, the key personnel here in the Admin Chronicle. The next thing I want to talk about here, again, under the Chronicle, is the Chronicle history. And do not worry, I'm not going to read this whole thing to you. It, you know, going back to 1833, there's, a, there's a, a lot of history here with the Chronicle. The Chronicle is actually part of um, my family's media um, conglomerate. We own, we own um, businesses and pretty much every form of mass media out there. It all started in 1833 with my great, great, great grandfather, Albert Havman. He's a Dutch immigrant to the United States, and he started the Havman Chronicle. And he really had a vision for mass media, and he really knew, could see when things were going to develop. So as new mass media became invented, like film and television and radio, he used the assets that he'd built up in the newspaper and in the other media to acquire media in these areas too. So the really interesting thing about the Havman Media Empire, I could be so bold as to call it that, that's not what I would call it, but that's what people call it, um, is that it really seems to model the history of mass media in the United States. That's one of the unique things about our organization, is um, we, we've struggled a lot. Of, our struggle is the struggle of mass media here in the United States. So um, I'm not expecting you to read it now, but you need to read this at some point so you have a, a history of where we've come and a sense of all the different media that we own and how they've developed. Um, because here at the newspaper, we don't just deal with writing things for the paper. We also have some things that we, we, we do in relation to our other media, our, our radio properties, our film properties, our TV properties, uh, magazines. You know, we've got a, a, a thumb in every pie. Is that what you say? A finger in every cookie? I don't know what you would call it. Um, so basically, this is the whole story. I know it's kind of long, but um, for those of you who are really serious about joining us at the Happen Chronicle and helping me make this and help me keep this a great newspaper, I'll need you to, to um, be up to date on the history here of everything that's going on. So let me summarize a little bit of, of how things have gone. So the main struggle we're in right now, the, the, the Chronicle has been handed down from generation to generation. My great-grandfather handed it down to my great-great-grandfather, handed it down to my great-grandfather, so on and so forth, until it was handed down to my parents. And the problem is that my parents could not decide which way to take it. My mom wanted to keep it family-owned, and she um, believed that with all her heart. My father, on the other hand, really felt that the right thing to do was to go public with so my mother was sort of like, we stay family owned or we die. My father was like, let's go publicly owned. It's not great, but at least maybe we'll last a little bit longer. Um, they could not agree. And because my parents could not agree on which direction to take the paper, it has been handed down to me. And so now it lies solely on my sh shoulders to save this paper. I want to keep it family owned. I think it's not just about continuing a legacy, but it's about the responsibility of journalism in the United States. And the trick is, I clearly can't do that myself. That's what I have you all here for right now. I need you to help me in this mission to, to do this and save the oldest family-owned newspaper in the United States. Okay. So that's a little history of uh, where we're at with that. Current challenges with the newspaper. We are still making money. We're not losing money. That's not the problem. The problem is that every year we're losing a little more circulation, a little more advertising revenue. So we're slowly dying. That's the trap that we're on right now. Um, some of that, uh, maybe you know, uh, Craigslist didn't do a whole lot of good for our classified sales. So because Cla Craigslist came in, our, our classified sales were decimated. And that was a major part of our funding for the paper. Um, obviously, there's other internet sources now that are free. And younger generations now, the generation, basically my generation, doesn't read newspapers. My parents' generation love newspapers. 
They still, still subscribe to newspapers. They still want that paper every day. But the younger generation doesn't. So we have some things to figure out. Maybe we stop printing the paper. Maybe we go online. How much do we charge people to go online? These are questions I'm going to be, I'm going to be asking you as you, as you um, go through the ranks here in the Havman Chronicle. Is how are we going to work around this? Are we going to just keep printing papers? Uh, are we going to try and appeal to the youth? Are we going to try and reformat the newspaper to appeal to the youth? Or is there no point? Should we strictly just forget about my generation? Continue to print the newspaper for the baby boomers, and once they all die off, the paper dies with them. Or do we, do we try and sell people my age that, hey, maybe you should get the paper every day, maybe just on the weekends, that kind of thing. So those are some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, ad, online ad revenue is not making up for the ad revenue that we've lost in the paper now. So basically, we're, we're slowly sinking. In just about every way, we could be slowly sinking. And we need to find some ways to get around that. And I need your help to do that. Um, Here's the timeline. Currently, our funds give us 15 weeks before we're dead. So we have 15 weeks to either turn this paper around and figure out some way to bring this thing back to life, to get, to get the charts going up again instead of going down, which has been going down for about the last 15 years. We have 15 weeks to do that. So that's our timeline. It's a hard number. Our accountants have, have done it for us. If nothing changes, we are dead in 15 weeks, and we go public. There's no choice. But if you all can do quality work that draws new readers, come up with good ideas for the newspaper, get more views for us, get people looking at us online, get people subscribing to the paper, then we can turn this around. Okay? And that's all very tangible stuff. You can, If you post a report and it gets... 5,000 views online. We know it got 5,000 views. And so we can tell how well you did in that article. All right, It's very tangible. And that's the kind of thing that I'm going to be looking for, is how is the work you did, how, how well that translated into the public, what kind of views you got for that. OK, so a um, little more uh, logistical stuff. For you, I know it's kind of foreign here. You're, you're brand new to the paper. I uh, imagine you've heard some things about it, but you don't really know about the day-to-day -day type stuff. So we have a few things for you under staff on the website that you can find. So here's some information on orientation. So if you have any questions about how the paper is run, how we do things in the paper, you can click on that. Uh, here's a little note from our um, executive assistant with some links to you know uh, details, um, manuals, all that sort of stuff. Um, so if we start here. Pretty should, should be pretty straightforward. We'll get you on the right path, and you can just continue down there. So that's under staff. Staff lounge, unfortunately, interns, is only for copy editors or above. So right now, you can't get in there. You need a password. When you've reached that level, when you've, when you've proven to us that you're here to stay, then we give you the, the password to the staff lounge, and you can go in there. I can't tell you what's in that. That's only for copy editors or above. So once you get that first promotion, then you get to kind of see what's going on in the staff lounge. And uh, trust me, interesting stuff in there. Now, um, in terms of promotion within the paper, here again are those levels. Now, I talked about views. I talked about how it's, it's you know very chain, um, tangible how well you're doing on the reports and the other work that you're doing. Um, we're going to be tracking those. So if you do an assignment for us and you pull in 5,000 views, that, that basically goes uh, into your little bank and you've, you've achieved 5,000 views. And when you've acquired, acquired enough views, when you've basically drawn enough people to the paper, you get promoted up a level. So give me a second here. I'll zoom in a little so you can see it. So at the intern level, where you're all starting, you basically have nothing. So um, if you don't work for it, you don't appreciate it, is my philosophy. Now, the first promotion is to copy editor. And that's when you achieve 15,000 views or more. And you're, so you're no longer the intern. You officially have a, a kind of a cool title. 
Um, I have a little information here about what the copy editor does, uh, does at a paper. And um, one of the main things that, that you get um, when you get promoted to copy editor is you do get access to the stack lounge. Now, when you get up to 30,000 views, you get promoted to features editor, and things start to get cool. So um, for our purposes, when you've achieved the levels of feature editor, you can now submit a story for the main page of the website. So you have a lot more publicity. And because you're on, you're on the main page, you're going to have opportunity for more people to see you, so you're more likely to get views. And so you can get up to 500 views is what we've seen for people going on to the uh, uh, posting to the main page. So what you do for that, you write an article, you know, we'll edit it, and then it gets put on the main page there with those scrolling images that you saw. And uh, you, that, for that, you get up to uh, 500 views. Um, and there's some more information there on, on the story, but it should be a contemporary issue in the mass media. Then, at level four, the opinion editor, that comes with 45,000 views. And with this, of course, you get everything um, beneath that. But you also get to submit a question for our employee evaluation. We have a little testing system that we do in the paper just to kind of make sure that everybody's staying up with the industry and all that. And what you get to do for that is actually post a, a question for the final um, test uh, employee evaluation there. Um, so that's level four. Level five, 60,000 views. You're a news editor. And so you get to do everything below that, but you also get to choose a partner for a project instead of having a partner assigned to you. You know, sometimes we have our favorites. And so you get to pick your teammate and work collaboratively, collaboratively on a project instead of working on your own. Um, so benefit to that is that now slightly less work for you and you get to pick out someone else that you, you've seen doing good work at the paper and work together, so a little less work and um, you know, two heads are better than one. Now at level six, uh, let's see, um, you have a chance to um, review another, you, basically you've proven me when you get to managing editor that not only can you do the work, but you can review other people's work. So you basically can review a lower level employee's work for an additional thousand points and that's on top of the other benefits you do. So someone in one of the lower levels will turn in an assignment, and I actually hand it to you to look at it, make notes on, edit it for them, give them that feedback, and then my compensation to you is a, a thousand views. Uh, okay, and then finally the editor-in-chief. So basically your partner's with me when you've reached the 90,000 level. And one of the really cool things about this level is that basically I give you a thousand views to give away to whoever you want in whatever way you want. You can't keep it for yourself. This is all about sharing. But maybe that partner that helped you achieve this um, really helped you out. You can gift them 1,000 views. Or maybe you want to spread it out to the whole class. So to kind of celebrate you know, your little champagne party you've been promoted to editor-in-chief, you're giving everybody in the class um, a chunk of those thousand views. So basically, when you've reached this level, um, one of the main things I want you to be able to do is share that joy with the other people in your class. Um, <clears throat> class of employees, and, and you know, that's what I meant. Slipping out of characters like that. All right, so that's the story on um, the levels and promotion. Um, in here, we'll see uh, all the different types of assignments that we've got, and, I, and just to so you can see what's coming up. We have a summary of assignments here. And so basically I've come out with a plan for the last 15 weeks. This is sort of my plan for what I'm going to have you working on every week um, with the idea that if everybody works on these things and does a good job, you might actually be able to pull this, um, pull this, uh, fill the holes and get this boat floating again. So. Um, uh, just a couple of sample ideas. Um, basically, one of the things I want my employees to be is very media literate. I want you to be aware of what's going on in the media. I want you to know the language of the media. I want to know want you to know all the stuff that the media is doing that you may not even be aware of. I can zoom in a little bit. Oh, can you see it okay? 
Don't need these ones? Okay. Um, so in the first one, I basically just want you to talk about how an experience with the media had an immediate effect on your life. I don't know if any of you, here's, this kind of comes from um, me watching Extreme Makeover Home Edition. Maybe some of you have had experiences like this too. I sit down, naively turn on the TV back when I had cable, Extreme Makeover Home Edition comes on. I'm like, oh yeah, this show's kind of cool. Um, I'm feeling generally pretty good about life and everything. Extreme Makeover comes on, and here's this poor, lowly person who's so deserving, and suddenly they get this massive, incredible house with a you know 10-foot diameter TV and a basketball court and Olympic pool and hell of hat and all this sort of stuff. And um, by the end of that show, I feel like I live in a really crappy house, pretty much. I'm also crying because it's really nice for that person. Yeah. But I feel really lame about my 40-inch TV and you know my Xbox 360, and that's about it that I've got. So after having enough of those experiences where I sat down feeling one way, and after an experience with the mass media, suddenly I was just thinking about different things that I wasn't thinking about before. I thought, I wonder if other people are paying attention to this, and how watching that TV show or that movie or reading that magazine, ladies especially, um, you pick up that fashion magazine, how do you feel about yourself afterward? One of the things about the media is that it doesn't necessarily tell you what to think, although a lot of times it really tries. What the media does is it tells you what to think about. And that's one of the things that bothers me about it, and that's one of the things that I really want to um, teach you as employees of my company. I want you to be aware of that, um, because we are a media business, so you need to be aware of how the media works. All right, so that's that's an example of the first assignment. Um, second assignment, of course, we got our hands in the book industry, too. So we'll be looking at, um, there's a political action committee lobbying Congress to get stricter on mass media because they claim it's all a vast wasteland. So really, in, in that second week, what I want you to do is to make, so write sort of an apology for the mass media. Apology in the sense of um, defending it. So what does the mass media offer um, that goes against this somewhat popular idea that, that it's a vast wasteland? What in there is worth saving? So um, sort of down the lines of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. We throw out all of the mass media. What kind of things in the mass media are actually doing their job well that are making society better, making us better people? And so I want you to um, write a report about that because we're a media conglomerate, so we catch a lot of that flack too because we got our hands in everything. We need to be able to defend some of the things we do and defend the idea that the mass media is not all bad. Okay, so in week three, what I'd like you to do um, is to um, write a um, report. Actually, I want you to do a radio podcast. That's one of the things that we're looking at getting into more about someone in the mass media who deserves to be highlighted in the Smithsonian. They're looking for some um, pioneers in mass media. And so what I'd like you to do for that is to create an argument for why this particular person deserves to be in the Smithsonian for that. And do it as a podcast. So it's going to be part of our radio program. And uh, so pick someone that, that you think is, is um, particularly interesting or would fit nicely as really a pioneer in the United States for mass media and do a little podcast about that. Um, we obviously don't have the resources to buy all of you audio recording devices. So I assume most of you have something basic like a smartphone. You don't have to edit this. Just record some sort of audio for us and submit that. A smartphone, maybe it's your computer, can record your speaking. Uh, maybe you got some little camera you can send us. So I imagine most of you, one way or another, can hustle some sort of digital audio recording device and, and get me that podcast, all right? And it should be interesting, for goodness sakes. You know, this isn't college when you wrote papers that were just freaking boring that nobody wanted to read, okay? We're trying to get people to listen to us. So I don't want the five-paragraph essay anymore. Nobody reads that stuff, okay? All that stuff they taught you in high school, and God forbid that maybe they told you that in college, forget it. We want stories, we want drama, we want characters. That's what your podcast needs to be. If you need some examples, you know, This American Life, Snap Judgment, uh, Radio Lab, I'm happy to give you examples. But I want it to be interesting. 
I don't assign these things just so you can spit out some boring essay um, on you know two hours before the deadline for the assignment. This is supposed to be interesting and it should be kind of fun, actually. So forget all that. Tell me a story. Share a character with me. But don't and don't don't read it. You know, have some inflection. If you turn in something that's like Nolan Bushnell invented Atari, and then he owned Chuck E. Cheese, and he had a lot of meetings in hot tubs, and um, made a lot of money off making really lousy Atari games until the video game crash of 1982 or whatever it was. Um, would you want to listen to that? Make something you want to listen to. Make something your friends want to listen to for that assignment. Give you a break sometimes here. You don't have an assignment. You just have uh, other work that you're doing for us. Um, so in assignment four, um, there's of course technology is breaking all the time. And so in assignment four, there's this company called Honeycrisp that's announced this new technology that detects your body language to determine your favorite TV programming, and automatically will change channels to programs that you like the best. That's interesting, but that's kind of scary. What does that mean for television programming in the future? Because the television arm of the Havin Media Empire is going to have to keep this in mind. What kind of programming would we produce in an environment where the television was changing channels based on how interested you seemed in the material? That's, that's the sea that we're floating in. We can't change that. We have to live with the situation that we're in. So what is that going to mean for us? If this empire is going to survive, we have to constantly be looking forward to the future. What's next? What's next? That's what's killed so many mass media enterprises, is they were just happy. Um, oh, so we're, doing, we're still making lots of money. We're just going to keep doing what we're doing. And then eventually the money stopped because somebody else came along that was better. So we always want to stay the best. We always want to stay cutting edge. Uh, then in assignment six, uh, Media Mogul was called out this week for airing video news releases on our TV news channel without disclosing them. A video news release is when basically a company or some sort of interest produce, produces a TV report that's meant to look like just a regular TV news report. But it's really, uh, uh, it's basically like a press release. It's, and it's made to look like the news agency itself made it. Maybe you've seen the press uh, news releases in the newspaper and sometimes they're they're indicated sometimes they're not you know you got to ask yourself okay was was that article about um, max new iPhone an article that the organization wrote that that was that they decided it was worthy of reporting on that or was it they just picked up a news release changed a few words and, and dropped it in because everybody's limited on staff so these news releases um, go in uh, basically every form of news media. And in the television news media, it's particularly, uh, I don't know, controversial. Because a lot of times they're not indicated. Some of the cues you can have with a video news release is when the anchor does not indicate the channel that they work for at the end. If, if the anchor doesn't have a channel that they work for, that they talk about, it's probably because they're working for the company that produced it. And we've got great examples for you, a uh, whole list of news releases as their originals, how they aired on the station, the company behind them. So um, we've got all sorts of information on that for you. But one of the questions is, what do we think about this? What are we going to do about this, especially in the realm of our um, television arm? Um, then in assignment six, uh, a major newspaper um, has declared bankruptcy, claiming the internet killed its revenue. And again, I want to do a podcast talking about um, the role of existing. Um, oh yeah, all right. So the idea here is um, again, we want to keep the podcast interesting and kind of different. So what I want you to do in that assignment is pretend like you're the role of a mass existing mass media, and a new mass medium has moved into the neighborhood. So basically, the podcast would be like, dear internet, it's so nice to have you on our street now. You know, we're so glad you moved into the old McClatchy house. We have a few complaints here at the newspaper house. 
we're a little concerned because basically you've been eroding our profit shares right now, that kind of thing. So it's basically kind of, instead of just talking about how one new medium affected another in this sort of like third person way, I want you to take on the personality of that medium and talk about how it personally affected you when that other medium came into place. Okay. So those are a few highlights. I don't want to give away everything on your assignments. As you go through the class, you will um, be able to uh, obviously you'll be able to see all those things. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about was um, badges. So we have little ways of recognizing good behavior and encouraging it. I don't want to say good behavior, but people who are um, doing things that, that we want to encourage, and mainly we want to do it, it doesn't affect your views at all, but it's just out there to kind of give you a little reward for being curious and for trying out things and for not waiting around for someone else to do something, but jumping in and filling that hole. So we have another, a number of badges for various stuff. Um, you'll find them out as you go through um, the class. I'm not going to necessarily tell you what they all are, but uh, you know things like posting to the uh, discussion boards because we need you to communicate with each other. We have things we have to sort out here in the paper, and I need your input on it. I want your input on it. Um, responding to other people, so engaging with each other and that kind of thing, getting assignments in on time, all that sort of stuff are things that we encourage. And in fact, right now I have some um, badges for people here right now already in our first staff meeting. So let me um, pull some of these out for you a second. And come with a little candy too, because who wants paper without candy? <laughs> so for front row seating, you get a badge for having the courage to sit in the front row. Act like you're not scared of me. <laughs> so you get candy for that too. And um, you get a badge for bearing, appearing very interested in stuff. And uh, now that I've given it away, anyone else? <coughs> He's on his phone right now. Oh, yeah, I got a badge for you. You look you get that. <laughs> I have badges for note taking, so you get. I have to come back with candy. Is anyone else? Note taking happens on phones. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll recognize that. You get a badge for note taking. Um, I didn't really say anything funny, so nobody gets a badge for laughing. Oh, there it was. Uh, there it is. Uh, there you go. It wasn't very good, but it was something. <laughs> Um, and then we have some more badges later on. Who did I, who did I neglect to get? You got two badges. Thank you got enough. We just one. Thank you. Yep. Uh, anybody else got, got a badge that I neglected to get for the candy? Did you get your candy? There you go. Anybody else? Okay. Um, all those badges are Erasmified, as I like to say. So if you open up the Erasmus app that they've been talking about and you follow UAF, search for and follow UAF, you got a little, got a little treat in there, assuming it works. So um, in conclusion, um, the future of this esteemed paper is in, oh, you're about to get a laughing badge, but it wasn't laughing at me. It's, it's, you only get the badge if you laugh at something I said. Oh, what? You gave the badge to her, she took the badge. So when you gave her her candy, I said, I'm taking you all are fired. That's very un. They're stealing them back. That is really interesting. Okay, well, I have a few more. I don't know about like, you know, backstabbing badge or something like that. The stealing candy badge. Um, share, yeah, share the love badge. How about that? <laughs> all right, we'll sort it out after. I got more candy. I didn't eat it all. Okay, so in conclusion, the future of this esteemed paper is in your hands. I can't do this alone. And whether it succeeds or fails um, really is your responsibility. And it means a tremendous amount to me what happens with this paper. I do not want to be the one who let it go. And I need all of you to help me 
keep this so I can pass it on to my daughter who can pass it on to her children. Okay, as a family-owned paper who's fulfilling the role of journalism in the United States, which isn't to report on celebrities and kiss the butts of politicians, but to really reveal what's going on in the world for um, the citizens of the world. Okay? And to be a watchdog. Um, if we get enough views to attract more advertising and more revenue, that paper is saved. And that um, total number of views, um, I forgot to go over it. I don't remember what it is off the top of my head. 90,000. What? 90,000. 90,000. No, that's, I'm talking about the, the whole group together gets us. I don't know who that guy is, but he's not working for us. <laughs> All of your views together will go into one large pool. If that pool reaches a high enough level, the paper is saved. Okay? So it's not just about, oh, I did great work. But if, if you did great work, but the people on your right and left didn't engage, didn't do their best work, didn't get assignments in on time, the paper still fails. So this is a group project. I mean, what newspaper in the world would survive if it had one great reporter and ten who just sat around their desk and converted Google News into, you know, the format of the paper, right? So it's our responsibility as a whole. It rests on all of our shoulders for this to work or fail. And um, if we go public, what are the consequences of that? Well, if you're not familiar with what happens, is it basically we become responsible to the shareholders. What do the shareholders care about? Money. Do they care about journalism? Not really, only as it relates to money. They want to see money, and they want to see more money every year. They don't want to see less money every year. What are they going to do to see more money every year? Expect cut staff. That's what's going to happen. So some of you may lose our jobs. Some of the people who have stayed with us for decades will be gone. Look at any newspaper in the United States who's had to go through this, decimating their staff. Because if you're not getting more money in, you have to reduce the cost of making the paper. And that's how it happens. So that's what's at stake here over the next 15 weeks. Are you going to join me in this? Are you going to help me save this paper? Are you going to help me save this pillar of journalism in the United States? Or are you going to walk away? The choice is up to you right now. You can leave. And that's fine. If you're not interested, if you're not interested in working hard, and if you're not passionate about this mission, please go find a passion for yourself. But if you are, if you think you can get behind me on this, I would love to have you there. And I would love to work with you to make this happen. Okay? Thank you very much. So jumping out of character now, we have about 10 minutes. Um, do you have any questions about what just happened? <laughs> what the heck is going on? <laughs> this is Journalism 101, Media and Culture, online at the University of Alaska. So it's online. It's online only, yep. So you got a great you know, uh, response from a live audience. How does it work? It's much more difficult. Yeah. So it's it's about um, sorry about the sun. Right. It's about uh, discussions, talking with people, um, getting those profiles up. One of the things I, I like about the podcast is you get to hear people's voices too when that works out. Um, so it's a little little bit more of a sense of who the other people are in the group. When when you do the intro class, do you do that as a Skype session or as a podcast, or how do you do that? When you what I'm doing right now is basically um, videos and audio on the website for each day. So I've created kind of a cool, <laughs> interesting one for the first day. I was like, what am I going to do? Like, One of the challenges I have for this was that I was trying to create multiple persons for myself. And then I was, because it was very confusing for the students, and it was kind of like, um, there, there were definitely some challenges, and still are challenges in this that have to be worked out. But here is, <laughs> so, I, I, and this class is, please, it's still in, um, under construction. There's still a lot that has to be done with it. But if this um, audio file loads up here, um, 
Let's see if we can hear it. Hey everybody, this is Theodore Hapman. Um, sorry I have to phone this one in. I'm in Tokyo right now trying to work on some of these business partners um, to help save the Chronicle. Um, I wanted to welcome you to the company. Um, obviously, uh, there's some turmoil going on in the Chronicle right now. Maybe you've heard about it. If you haven't, check out uh, the Chronicle history, which you can find under the Chronicle link on our main page there. And I won't fill you on. All right, so I won't make you listen to the whole thing, but one of the ways I kind of one of the ways I got kind of got around like, am I am I the professor and the chairman and the president? You know, the sort of the things that and it, am I is everybody Robert Prince or you know one of the ways I got around that was doing audio without video, so you can't see who I am. Um, and this was fun because <laughs> I actually uh, went on YouTube and looked for I like Googled like Japanese taxi. And I got video, or, or, or inside a car in Japan, I got video of people talking in Japanese. I, I grabbed the audio off of that, mixed it in with my voice, so then in the background you hear people driving and talking in Japanese to try and elevate the level a little bit of, of authenticity so that they might actually be like, wow, is that, that dude actually in Japan? Um, didn't come through terribly well here, but um, the idea that, you know, trying to, to immerse them in this environment so it really feels like it's true, because otherwise, you know, it takes away a lot of the motivation. Yeah? Do you, do you use the live or the collaborate sessions at all and have, like, a live class um, during the course? Or is it all online? Right now, it's online. I haven't tried that. I mean, that is online, too, but what I mean Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, it's all, um, what would you call, like, not congruent? Not the, asynchronous. asynchronous, thank you. So it's all asynchronous right now. Um, on um, this is a, a WordPress site that we made. One of the main challenges I have is this inexplicable jump to Blackboard that they have to make once in a while, and trying to explain how that fits into the story, and it doesn't, and it sucks, honestly. And so, uh, you know, I've been working with with my designers, Owen Guthrie, Dan Lasota back there, who presented this morning, um, have both been helping me with um, this class and other things I'm working on. And so, what? What I'm trying to figure out is where is the place where I can have Blackboard and WordPress together? And I've heard some suggestions, I, and I haven't had a chance to really explore it. But when those two come together, where I can enter grades securely for you, but also have something that looks like a web page and not the piece of crap that is um, Blackboard, party, I, I hate it. <laughs> As I imagine most of you do too, and I, you know, I sympathize with the people who have to design it for everyone. But right now, it looks horrible um, when you're trying to create a gamified course like this. So um, someday it's going to be there. Um, basically, a blackboard that I can make look like a web page that people from outside can look at, but the students can still see their own grades privately. Um, sorry. to the discussion, and so there wasn't really any natural way that you would see what, I mean, you just go in there to do the assignment, you'd post your, your thoughts on the discussion. That seemed like the natural way to do it. But I decided the way I really need to do it is post the discussion myself and have them all reply to my post rather than making their own post. That was one major thing that's going to change the next time I teach this class, because that will help them all kind of see each other and be more inclined to reply to each other. There was a question in the middle, not over here. 
Yeah. Um, I'm just curious how the views actually work. Is it used from other people in the class? Is it people from outside? Is it points for assignments? Like, how is that? It's points for assignments right now. I just give it a different name. I came up with 100,000 points in the class overall because it's big, but I feel like it's not too big. And then I can give you things like, you know, 100 points, 500 points for various stuff. And you're like, oh, that sounds cool. In the grand scheme, it's really not all that big. But it's essentially your, your grade. Is, you're graded in views. You had a question? Um, I'm just wondering, how has been your withdrawal rate to your online class? Have you seen noticeable, like, less in your unified class versus other online courses offering? Um, this is the only class that I teach online. And it, it basically started out as a correspondence course where none of the students had anything to do with each other. It was really bad. And so I worked to convert it into this. Um, and uh, I would say um, it's maybe been a little better right now. But we're, I'm honestly very, pretty early in, in this class. What I didn't. What I don't want to tell all of you that is that I've only taught this once. So uh, it's still very early on, and so I've only had one class to try it with. And I learned a lot this last time that I taught it. Um, what I really liked that I saw teaching it this way than before was students taking on the roles when they were, when they were posting in their discussions. Like, I think we should type stuff. That really encouraged me because now, you know, it's more of a group thing instead of just, oh, I, when I, you know, I think the mass media is great or something like that. Who cares? What do you think we should do? Um, and so some of the funnest things about this have been trying to think up, think up incentives. I think life is all about incentives. And obviously you can't give students just points for everything. You know, everybody's going to end up with 150% by the end of the class or something like that. You're giving extra credit for everything. But what kind of things can you give students that will incentivize them that don't actually have much of a pertinence on their grade? Because I think those of you who teach, no, oh, it's all right. <laughs> those of uh, you who um, teach know that all they want to generally, what it feels like, all they want to know is how much is this worth? Um, what's when am I going to get graded on it? And heaven forbid you turn out something that that has no points assigned to it. Um, who cares? Yeah, so what are some things you can do? So that's where like access to the staff lounge came to mind. Yeah. Is that curiosity? Well, you won't know. You <laughs> no, what's in there right now are basically like YouTube videos that, I, that either relate to mass media or I just think are funny. So it's kind of like here's a little reward as you get to watch some YouTube videos and maybe other people will post YouTube videos and that kind of thing. Um, other stuff that could help them in the class, or, or maybe be stuff that they haven't heard of before that would be interesting. Um, any, any sort of little thing that you can think of to throw in there, but it's just basically a bunch of web links and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think we're pretty close here. Uh, final question or anything? If you have any trouble with the Orasma thing, um, let me know. I always feel like I have a doctor. Like, If you're having trouble with your Orasma, let me know, and I have a, <laughs> I have a cure for you. It's old. You know, my mom passed it down to me. But um, it should work. I've tried it a couple times, and it seems to work, but I'm new to harass it on myself. So. Anyway, thanks a lot. I have cards, too, if any of you want more information from me. Um, but I really appreciate your attentiveness. And, uh, yeah, come on up. I'll give you a certificate for something.